Okay. Let's see. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Beautiful. Okay. Wonderful. How's everybody doing with hand gestures? Yeah. <laughs> um, so while people are joining and like figuring things out, um, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Yes. Very excited to have you. Um, I think to start off with, um, oh, I have to admit people. This is a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think a quick intro to myself. I'm I, Katie Minecraft. I'm one of the founders of the Katie campaign. Um, this whole webinar we're really excited about because it's Mandela Day! Yay! Um, and um, we wanted to create a platform where young people can share what they're doing and what they feel is their plan for making the future better for everybody. Um, we have some really bad panel members. Um, and um, we're really excited to share uh, the, the, their stories or for them to share their stories with, with you guys. Um, so, some house rules before we go into, um, big things. Um, please make sure that you are on mute if you are not speaking. Um, we, <laughs> please figure out which view works best for you if you want to do speak of you while the panel is happening so you can see our beautiful panelists try to do that if you just want to see everybody cool um each to their own couple other things um when when i find my notes properly um Please use the chat. So we would like you in this two minute period, I guess, to please introduce yourself in the chat box. Use your name and what city you're joining from so that we can keep track of how far our network is going and all of those beautiful things. Please make sure that your name is accurate. Um, on your webinar to reflect those things. Um, and then please feel free to take photos and share them with your networks and on Instagram and all of these places. Um, and yes, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Lauren, who is going to be the moderator for our first bit, which is the panel discussion. So, Lauren. Good morning, everybody. Thank or afternoon, I suppose, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, this is the beginning of what will become a series of conversations with Kaylee. The name is, of course, a work in progress, as everything else is. 
where Kaylee will host a panel of accomplished activists and others who are experiencing or living or changing through some of the challenges that this world is facing today. Uh, my name is Lauren Forstbauer. I've taught history for 10 years. Um, I try as best I can to use my platform as a classroom teacher to instill an activist spirit in my students and to constantly make them question the world around them. So as we move forward, what we will do first is introduce our panelists, beginning with Ashley. You wanna say a few things and maybe something that you've done differently or something that you've done during quarantine or a new habit or skill or something that's popped onto your radar in these last trying couple of months. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, thanks, Katie, so much for getting this together and everyone else for coming. It's so uh, yeah, great to have this amazing group all together. Uh, I was actually typing in my, hey, from London, um, as you were like to Ashley. I was like, well, might as well just say it then. Um, so yeah, I'm Ashley Lopez. Uh, I'm the executive director of an organization called Sprint for Her SA. Um, and I'm sure we'll all go into our organizations and that a bit later. Um, and yeah, I'm a South African currently living in London. Um, and yeah, for sure, I've, I've been one of those people that is like, well, this is the time to try all the new things I haven't tried before and some have gone much better than others. Um, I am officially a crazy plant lady. Um, I'm not allowed to buy any more plants. It's been ruled by the family, um, especially until I prove that I can keep the current ones alive. But we have two very successful flower pots of sunflowers coming up, so stay tuned. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, for me, what's been really helpful is just journaling. I just think there's so much chaos happening at the moment. Uh, if I feel something is maybe something other people might be able to relate to, sometimes I put it on Facebook. Sometimes I think it's better to just shh and listen. Um, and yeah, so it's really just been weighing that up. And uh, uh, lots of reality shows where people make things. I'm really enjoying that at the moment. Repair shop in the UK will bring you to tears, but it's amazing seeing people restore old things and just makes me think there's a little bit of hope in reality TV. So yeah, that's been my coping mechanism throughout this. Thank you so much, Ashley, and I hope your plants stay alive. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from Melina. Hi there, Lauren and Kylie. Thank you so much for having me on the platform today. Um, to everyone else, I am Melina Rousseau and I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm a human rights lawyer by profession, the founder of an organization called the Women Lead Movement, which I'll talk about a bit later on. Um, I have learned two skills. You know, the first one, I actually spoke about it earlier. I'm, I'm generally a people's pleaser. So pre-COVID, I would say yes to practically anything because I couldn't say no. But during COVID and with all the negativity that's happening in the world, I, I just felt that I needed to sort of be a bit more protective of my, of my space and self. And so I've actually learned to say no. And, and I know that sounds cruel, but it really helped me so much to sort of, you know, plan my own day um, and decide on things that I want to invest uh, my energy and my resources on. So that was the first skill that I sort of mastered. I think I'm going to be brilliant after COVID. The second thing is I am not a cook or a baker at all. And I've invested like my entire young or youthful life in the work that I do. So I've actually learned to bake uh, during the COVID period, which is amazing. And I'm very proud of myself. You know, I, I still can't cook, but at least the baking aspect of, of sort of my, you know, uh, talents has, uh, has been added. That's excellent. Excellent. When we come to Cape Town, we'll have to try some of your new baking skills. Uh, next up, we have our youngest panelist, Ashlyn. Good morning, Ashlyn. Hello. Um, so I'm Ashlyn. I'm the founder of Raising Hope South Africa. Um, during this lockdown, I started volunteering at a homeless shelter and I now run the kids program there. And I learned to play piano, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I'll tell you more about Raising Hope later. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. And our final panelist this morning is Wally. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Wally. Super excited to be here. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, excited to join the other panelists and be part of this discussion. 
Uh, one of the things that I do that makes me unique on this panel is uh, I do something called spoken word poetry, which is a, a form of, of literary art that uh, some of you may be familiar with. If you're not familiar with it, I actually have a piece that I want to get right into to share with you and get your thoughts on. So let me know what you think of this piece. And I'm excited for the panel discussion after. This poem goes out to the graduating class of 2020. Graduating class of 2020. Respectfully, this world has lost to COVID. Nobody believes that making it through this together is possible. This won't pass. It's meaningless to think. If we just keep our distance, we'll be fine. Keep letting our environment die. There's no more time to make things better. We could do better for the world until we remember money and clout is the most important thing in life. Family is all we have. It's hard to hear when we fight all the time these days. We will be fine is a lie. No one will take our call. This was a permanent L. Nobody will say, you saved my life, so thank you for sacrificing your graduation, unless we reverse things. You saved my life, so thank you for sacrificing your graduation. Nobody will say this was a permanent L. We fight all the time these days is hard to hear when family is all we have. It's time to make things better. There's no more letting our environment die. Money and clout is the most important thing in life until we remember we could do better for the world. If we just keep our distance, we'll be fine. It's meaningless to think that this won't pass. Making it through this together is possible. Nobody believes that this world has lost to COVID. Respectfully, graduating class of 2020. Thank you, everyone. That was incredible, Wally. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, we have a phenomenal panelist, panel group this morning. Um, as we move forward, those of you attending, if you have any questions, we invite you to submit them to the panelists. We are asking that you type in the chat box and that you preface your question with the word question so that nothing gets missed as we move through this morning's conversation. Um, so as we begin, panelists, if you would like to introduce yourselves and speak a little bit more about the work that you have accomplished as activists within your organizations and otherwise, um, we can begin in the same order that we worked in introductions, beginning with Ashley. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, it's so funny, um, I think until this year when I started working more formally with Sprint for Her SA, I kind of thought of myself more as just like a solo activist, like someone who always liked to get up on their soapbox and, you know, talk about things and, um, you know, often the one at dinner parties where you have to be like, okay, Ash, like, cool, you know, and, um, you know, that's kind of more, I felt like having a bit more of like individual activism um, and, I think when uh, we were at university, I think for me, that's when things really started to, to pick up. Um, I was at UCT uh, in my final year of my undergrad during 2015, which is when Roads Must Fall and in out, end outsourcing, remember Marikana and Fees Must Fall all happened within that year. And um, for me, it was a really conflicting, but really amazing time because it really made me look at my role as a young person, as a white person, as a privileged person in South Africa and the role between taking a stand when things don't affect you and also knowing when to step back and let other people take the forefront because they don't affect you. And for me, I think those are two big things that I would use to describe 
um, my activism, which all kind of goes around the term of intersectionality, which is uh, a phrase coined by the amazing Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in the States. And it basically says that we are a component of all of our parts of our identity. No one is just white. You know, you are like a white, heterosexual, um, cisgendered, able-bodied, you know, person from this religion of this country. And that we have to bring all of those identities together when we deal with anything. And so that's how I would say I, I approach my activism. I started off um, with Kaylee working at IKEability uh, as a society. We had at UCT uh, alongside Taylor. I can see you over here. Um, and yeah, that's when I really got into the um, ability activism environment. I myself have a neuroimmune disorder and uh, that also largely I realized I couldn't really protest like everybody else did because my body really takes a, a huge toll. Um, but I didn't want to sit and do nothing. I felt it was, you know, the time that we just couldn't be complacent. We had to be a part of history. We had to do things. And um, that's how Kaylee really got me into the activism world big time then and got to get involved and meet the fabulous Mama Zelda and uh, work with the Kaylee campaign. And we ended up going to the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates last year where we met Laura. Um, and that was absolutely incredible and just made me realize that this is really all I want to do with my life when you, you know, watch people like that. And then got to go up close with an amazing activist and leader, Kaylee Mycroft, uh, when she got invited to the UN General Assembly. And I went as her personal care assistant, having never done that before. The fact that we both made it out alive is really quite amazing. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where um, I started there. Sprint for Her was something my friends actually started in 2016. We uh, so are an online community um, to support victims and survivors of uh, sexual and gender-based violence through exercise as a way of reclaiming your bodily autonomy. We're a social media movement and our whole uh, focus is that we want people to feel they can do something in their everyday life, to take a stand in a way that doesn't mean just because you can't donate, just because you can't rally you know at the gates of parliament because you can't change the laws that there is something we can each do and make our lives about taking a stand and knowing that their values that we're saying to people i'm an ally if you have a story i will listen and i'm going to believe you and i'm going to support you and a lot of survivors uh, struggle to speak about things like that and we've had a lot of people coming forward and saying that just watching the support of strangers on movements like ours enable them to speak to their own families and their own friends because it made them see that there are more people out there that believe you than what you might think. Um, and yeah, so this year I was made Sprint for Her SA's executive director and uh, we've just tried to clamp down on lockdown conditions. We've done exercise classes from home for free. At the moment we're doing a uh, 114 kilometer campaign in the lead up until Women's Day, which you can do as a team and you can do walking, which is what I'm doing. Um, and we're doing that because there are 114 rapes reported to SAPS uh, on average daily, at least from the uh, report that was given for the 2018, 2019 year. And so it's about people taking a stand in their everyday lives and knowing that each one of you can do something, even if it's as simple as, you know, showing it on your social media that you're an ally and you support us. And uh, yeah, and then we also, we fundraise for worthy organizations. At the moment, we're uh, fundraising for the Frida Hartley Shelter, um, which takes in women and children affected by uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And so rather than handle the money ourselves, we funneled through grassroots organizations because they're the ones who are actually on the ground. They know what the women in their communities need better than we could ever from our you know, varying points in life. And so that's our way of communicating with through organizations who really know what they're doing and just trying to help them a bit financially. Thank you so much. And your work truly is inspiring. Um, <clears throat> Kaylee will put up a list of everyone's social media lately and I, absolutely suggest following Ash. I've been following her Sprint for South Africa workouts and the kilometer challenge that you're doing as well. Thank you. Uh, Melina, would you care to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Goodness, Lauren, I am probably the oldest one amongst these panelists here, so I don't know if I have to now date back literally a decade, you know, because the organization that I founded was about three years ago in 2017, which is the Women Lead Movement. I'll talk a bit about that. But my activism, I believe, started 10 years prior to that um, because I was admitted as an attorney in 2009. 
But let me also just give a disclaimer. I, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I never wanted to be a politician. I never wanted to be an activist. I really just wanted to write books that my mom thought that was a dumb idea um, and that I actually needed to get something, you know, like solid behind my name. And so I studied law and I'm not looking back because it was at university level where I fell in love with constitutional law and, and, uh, and human rights law in, in, in particular. And so after university, when I moved into legal practice, I realized that I was going to probably be the poorest lawyer ever because I couldn't charge people money for my services, which was embarrassing because I work in a private law firm. And I realized that my background also where I came from um, growing up on the Cape Flats, I knew that access to justice for many people in disadvantaged communities was still a big problem. And that really interfered in terms of my success within private practice because ultimately I couldn't charge people money. I thought, okay, this is not gonna work. Let me move along. And uh, I ultimately ended up at the Constitutional Court, working for Justice Albie Sachs, which is a renowned judge in not only South Africa, but across the world. And I was very privileged to have worked with him. And this was also, I think, one of the catalytic moments for me when things were the penny, when, when the penny dropped. It was a case that we heard in the Constitutional Court in 2009. It was about a mass eviction um, of an informal settlement here in Cape Town called Joe Slovo. And although the intention of the government was to build houses for these thousands of people, the, the method that they chose to do so was unconstitutional in that they did not engage the people that they were actually now evicting. And it was really a top-down approach to governance and not necessarily engaging the people on decisions that they are taking that is going to affect these people directly. And that left something with me. And after that, I decided, and this way, I think my first step to activism was writing my thesis on public participation. And, you know, how I believe that public participation was actually the key to realizing socioeconomic rights, how important it is to get sort of the input from the general public, the ordinary citizen into these government decision-making processes because I just generally felt that government had a lot of power and they were sort of dictating to people how things should be done. One thing led to another, I ended up in government, you know, so, so shifting from this whole legal space, I moved into, you know, government and not local government. I, my first job in government was working in the president's office with Jacob Zuma, you know, so, so it was Zuma and then I worked with two other ministers. I was an advisor on various platforms and that is where I saw how things should not be done. All my experiences that I've, or the platforms that I've worked in were very high level, but with, it wasn't always a good experience because I also saw how people were excluded yet again from, you know, the, you know, the, the, the general engagement or decision making. And it was after that, and I think that was in 2017 when I said, listen here, there is definitely a problem here. Um, you know, because the scales, the, the, in terms of, you know, power imbalance between government and the people were really uneven and we, didn't need to re we need to rectify that. But how will we do that? And I realized that people didn't know what democracy or they didn't understand what democracy means in South Africa. In fact, the Foundation for Human Rights found that only 50% of people in South Africa actually knows about the constitution and they know about the human rights. And for me, when I started the Women Lead Movement, the most important thing was to educate people about democracy, was to educate people about the constitution. It was to get people to move from the apathy into action. Because, you know, obviously when you have an apathetic citizenry, government takes over and that is why we see corruption and all these things taking over because we don't have the oversight of the people. And my job really, and I was convicted, to ensure that people are educated enough to deal with government on an equal platform. So that is where the active and participatory component of the Women Lead Movement came in. But obviously as a woman, working in the legal profession, working within the political space, also exposed me a lot to gender discrimination. And I didn't see a lot of people working in the political space. And I didn't see a lot of women working in the legal, uh, in the legal or the legislative spaces. And that concerned me greatly. And that is why we also have a second link to Women Lead Movement. And at the beginning was difficult because my partners at the beginning said, listen, we need to choose one thing. I said, I can't choose one thing because both of these things are equally important. Promoting a gender equal society, both socially, politically, economically, and in health, as well as creating an active and participatory citizen 
citizenry is equally important. So those are the two legs on which the woman in movement is basically uh, uh, um, founded. I mean, over the last three years, we have reached immense heights. We have reached about two and, two and a half thousand people already with our programs within the communities. And that is through education, empowerment, community dialogues. It's where we bring the government and the people together in a wall in whatever community. And they discuss the issues that is facing that community and come up with solutions. Because I hate being in discussions where people are just constantly complaining about how things are not working instead of having a proactive mindset in saying, how do we address these issues? What do we do as community people to solve the issues that is plaguing this community and not leaving that into government's hands? Because government is not going to fix it. Let me tell you that they are not the Messiah that is going to miraculously fix that. We are the people that need to do that. So we need to empower the people to do that. Um, we've also started an organization, the Women, the Women in Movement in Madagascar, which actually happened in June, which is a massive leap for my organization, because we also see the Women in Movement expanding across the African continent. So in the next 10 to 15 years, we would want to have a footprint in at least 10 countries within the African continent, because the issue of apathy is not a South African issue alone. The issue of gender inequality is not a South African issue alone. It's not even a continental issue. It's a global issue. And so we want to sort of expand the Women Need Movement and its programs across the continent so that it can reach more people, in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you so very much for sharing and truly tr such tremendous work that you've done. Thank you very much. Uh, Ashlyn, would you like to introduce your work to us? Yeah, so I do ability activism um, for children and adults with disabilities. I started fundraising when I was seven years old and then met Katie and Auntie Zelda when I was eight and was part of the KD Campaign and Masters program in Cape Town for about nine years from there. And from there, I started my own nonprofit organization called Raising Hope South Africa. And we run a whole lot of projects to feed and provide therapies to families impacted with people with disabilities. During the lockdown, especially, we have given out over 300 food parcels to those who need food who don't have the money during lockdown so we get together and we just help these people we are starting a school type uh building in malco fontaine which is just outside of cape town where we're going to have therapists and teachers and just a place we're calling it a growth point where we can just help those who don't have access to therapies and anything that they may need to live their best life. So that's basically what we do in a nutshell. That's incredible, Ashlyn. Thank you so much for sharing. And finally, Wally, if you could introduce a little bit more about your work. We've already heard one of your amazing poems. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the scope of your work. Thanks, Lauren. So I feel very grateful to be able to have a art form that allows me to creatively express the things that I feel. Where this started though, was when I was in high school and as a kid, my personal narrative was out of a lot of struggle and challenges. My family came from Pakistan to Canada when I was three years old. So coming from an immigrant family was difficult in terms of transitioning to a new environment. My parents had to learn a new language. There was a large disconnect between me and my parents because of the cultural gap that had shifted coming to a new country. and so. A lot of my younger years were trying to figure out how to adjust to living in a Western society with my parents having very different norms and values. And it was little conversations like, you got to go to school and go to university and be a lawyer or a doctor and me saying, I'm really interested in just in, in creating art and doing something for the world and being a change maker in my own right and them not even understanding that. And so I, I really fought for a long time in terms of not only figuring out who I was and my identity and fig figuring out what will I contribute to the world, but how to navigate these, these spaces of trying to reconcile with my parents in terms of forging a path for myself. And because there was so much of you know, mental health and there was, there was bullying, and after 9-11, any South Asian person was not safe <laughs> at school. You were gonna get bullied nonstop. 
um, I really felt like there was there was something powerful about poetry that could be an agent for change in regards to discrimination, in regards to uh, being a voice for a voice for immigrants, being a voice for being bullied, being a voice for those who were experiencing issues with mental illness. And so my art form and the fuel for it really came from a desire to change the world for the better. And in high school, I was, I was lucky enough to have a great teacher who gave me a book of poetry that introduced me to the art form. And I never looked back ever since then. And so um, fast forward 10 years from now, uh, from then rather, uh, at 25 years old, I've been really, really lucky, really fortunate and blessed. Uh, to be able to travel all over the world. Uh, most of my states is in the United States and in Canada, uh, working with community colleges and, and universities and high schools, talking about some of these important issues, uh, having dialogue on uh, being an immigrant, the challenges that come with that, being a person of color and what, you know, what that entails and how to navigate a space where you are a minority. Uh, these are really important conversations and having the discussion through art makes them so much more engaging. People can relate to it a little bit more and it's something that's really cool. It's well, it's, it's well packaged. And I think that was always my, my perspective going in. I wanted to be able to creatively express ideas that were difficult to have conversations about. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to have that uh, opportunity as a speaker and as a performer, um, done lots of cool stuff. Got the chance to, to freestyle with Kendrick Lamar a few years back and um, earlier this year, I got the chance to meet uh, President Barack Obama and perform, perform for him uh, prior to COVID, but uh, I'd love to share more, more experiences uh, later on in the panel, but that's just a little bit about my story, my narrative in a nutshell. Thank you so much, and your work truly is amazing. Spoken word is so powerful. Um, a little bit, a couple of follow-up questions to the introduction. Ashlyn, the first one is for you. What inspired you uh, to begin your work? What inspired you to work in the disability sector? Um, both my brothers have disabilities. They are both younger than me. They are 12 and 15. I feel like they're old. Um, and so um, I've always been influenced by disability. Luckily, my parents had a positive image on it, so I was influenced with positivity on it. And there were just things that they couldn't do because it wasn't inclusive enough. And so that sort of just started my whole thing to make the world a more inclusive place. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Wally, we have a follow-up question for you. When did you first realize the power of words? Was there a particular aha moment that led to your first public performance? And when and where did you first perform? So in high school, this is a little bit of a backstory here to preface it. In high school, I was the kind of kid that was getting into a lot of trouble. My teachers, I was a kid that teachers didn't want in their class because I was always just causing trouble. And, you know, I think I had, I had so much anxiety as a kid to be accepted and to fit in because of, because of the fact that my, my narrative was one of questioning my identity my whole life, that it was anything to fit in anything to be the cool kid, anything to be the class clown and get a couple laughs because I didn't always get that from my parents. They were always working hard. They came from the country and didn't understand, you know, the, the challenges that I was dealing with because their challenge was putting food on the table. So for me, it was really about how do I fit in and how do I, you know, how do I really get accepted into this new society that, I, that I'm, I'm struggling to be a part of being an outsider looking in? And so I think really my, my aha moment came when, you know, I was in the middle of all this. I had, I had a lot of really tough challenges and there was a teacher who introduced me to poetry. And, um, you know, at the time I was, I was struggling academically. I was struggling in my personal life. I, I didn't want to go to school. I was skipping class. I was hanging out with the wrong people, getting into fights. You know, it was, it was a tough time for me. And she, and she recognized that and she stopped me in the hallway uh, one day right after school. And she said, I want to talk to you. And I thought I was in trouble. And I was like, okay, great. Another teacher trying to, you know, get me uh, in trouble and whatever. Went to the English department office and uh, she just wanted to have a chat. And it was the first time I really had an open and honest conversation with, with anybody, really, uh, let alone a teacher. And so at the end of that conversation, she asked me a question that I'll never forget. She looked me dead in the eye 
And she said, Wally, do you know where the richest place on earth is? And I stopped and I was confused. Like I never had anyone ask me a question like that. And I thought it was like a trick question or whatever. So I thought about it for a second. I was like, it's Dubai. It's got to be Dubai. <laughs> Dubai is the richest place on earth. Then she laughed and she said, no, it's not. I took another guess. I didn't, I didn't get it right. And she said, Wally, the richest place on earth is a graveyard. Do you know why? I said, no, I have no idea. She said, it's because it's rich, full of untapped potential. And when I look at all my students, I see a tremendous amount of potential. And I want all of them to live up to that full potential. And I see so much potential in you. I was the kid that teachers did not want in their class. I was the kid that was getting suspended in school. My parents would fight with me every night about not doing well academically. This was the first time in my life that I had an educator do that. And it changed my, I believed in myself for the first time. And she gave me a book, the book was called The Rose That Grew From Concrete. It was a book of poetry written by a well-known artist named Tupac Shakur. And when I read this book, the themes that Tupac was talking about, the ideas in this book were so relatable. He was talking about growing up with lack of a father figure. He was talking about growing up in a community where there was drugs running rampant and people were, were, were resorting to questionable lifestyles to be able to get by and to fit in. And these were all things that I saw growing up, coming from a low social economic community, trying to fit in, trying to be the cool kid at school. I, I saw people get involved in these things and I could relate to what was being written and I wanted to write something similar and I wanted to share. And so the first time I did a performance was in Miss Riley's English class, the teacher who gave me that book at the end of the class. See, um, at the end of that semester, uh, last in the last class, we were asked to, to share our own personal work if we had written anything during the semester. And, uh, and I shared a poem that I've written after reading that book. That's how the journey started. And here we are. That's incredible. Wow. Wow. That's outstanding. Um, <clears throat> we have a question posed to the panel about essentially inspiring activism in people of all ages, which I think is a phenomenal question because our panel is such a diverse age group. We have Ashlyn and then we you know, move forward to Melina, who's a little further in her career, right? So my question to the panel from our participants is how do you inspire activism in those who are otherwise apathetic, both in teenagers and adults? And anyone can start this one. I won't put Ashley on the spot this time. I think I will, I will attempt that one as well, you know, because, um... I'm in the business of hoping, uh, of inspiring community people to, to move from apathy into action. So I think that is, is important. Unfortunately, you inspire people by outlining the problems and the challenges of the country. And once people realize that those challenges and those issues also have and will have a direct bearing on their own lives, something, something changes because you don't want that. And so automatically, and I mean, there's various issues. I mean, I deal with sort of serious stuff like political, legal, uh, you know, community development kind of stuff. But they, they are things like environmental uh, awareness raising campaigns, which is equally important. Um, and we're all affected by environmental challenges, for example. And if you can educate and explain to people what the impact of um, not looking after the environment will be, and how that will affect your own life. And you know, it will inspire people automatically to want to act. The only thing is, people don't know what to do. And that is also my um, sort of finding in the community. It wasn't necessarily that people, there were some that were like, no, listen, I actually don't care, you know? And then there were those that, I actually do care, but how do I get involved? What do I do? And so that is where your expertise, your knowledge, and your just general motivation is going to come in to show them the way. One thing that I, uh, that I do besides the education is I help communities develop what, they, what I call the community action plans. And so when I leave, I leave them with something. I leave them with a plan of action for a year at least. Because then in that way, I am guaranteed 
that when I come back to you in six months, you would have started implementing projects and programs that will address the issue um, in a systemic way. Um, and so obviously we'll evaluate the impact of that action and people feel really empowered once they start doing things. And that is really what you want. You see an activist sparks the fire in someone else. That is an activist. An activist is a catalyst. It's the vessel that you use to impact and inspire other people. And once you can, or you have that power to do that, I mean, the possibilities are endless, but you need to hold hands as far as you possibly can, show them what they should do, and then leave them to do it. Thank you so much. Your community action plans truly sound tremendous. Did any of the other panelists want to address the question about inspiring activism in an otherwise apathetic population? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, I think, yeah, Melina, I think what you said was so uh, pertinent about people needing to see something as it pertains to themselves. But, and I think, um, I don't know, in a lot of ways, I think that um, it's, a, it's a problem almost that people don't think that something is their problem until they see it in a way that it affects them. But unfortunately, I think that's just how humans operate. And so for me, a way that I've, um, I found ways that I think I've been able to connect to people are by telling other people's stories. And so when it's experiences that we can't speak to and someone, you know, says something that's like, personally, I, I have a problem with people who say all lives matter and we won't get into all of that, but I have a problem with that. And so when somebody says that, and which is a statement that I feel to be harmful, even though it is not personally harmful to me, um, I think the best way is to say, well, let me find a personal account, someone telling their own story of why that phrase is upsetting or a part of their lives where it shows the, the nuances behind it in a way that I could never do it. And that's why I think also like Wally's work is so powerful in that way because anyone who can vocalize or can you turn into art something that is so powerful, that is so personal in the way that it can speak to others who, and make them feel something even though they have no reference of it themselves is a really unique talent to have. And an example of mine um, that I've been sharing with a lot of people lately is by an, a motivational speaker called Shola Richards, Shola Richards, uh, who is an African American man, and he wrote this um, stunning post about how he doesn't feel comfortable going out for a walk around his suburb unless he's with his two young daughters and their fluffy dog. And he says, "Because when I'm with my two young daughters and the fluffy dog, I'm a family man." You know, he says, "I'm, you know." going around the suburbs where, you know, getting our exercise, we're all wearing our masks, we're socially responsible people, but I'm by myself for a walk and I'm a tall black man wearing a mask. And he says, going around the suburbs. And we know what happens in those instances. And I found that one particularly um, effective in talking to men about, because it's like, well, how disempowered do you have to be where you are scared of the fact that people think you're a threat just by having a walk? And that's something that a lot of people can't remotely fathom, that that's a level, that's how constricted your liberty is, because it actually could be a matter of life or death. And for me, it's something that I just found that story and the way that he wrote it was just so amazing that sometimes it's about stepping back and saying, please read this, try and understand these different viewpoints that we can't possibly, and maybe if we just elevate the platforms of other people's voices to make these narratives more common, maybe more people will understand because they no one else can speak from the heart in that way and you know if people were all as poetically brilliant as wally you know then that would be amazing and i'm sure everyone would you know feel all the feel all the feels but i think yeah we need to be elevating the voices for you know causes that we don't necessarily can't speak to but no need to be spoken for excellent thank you um i'm actually going to steer this the same question to Ashlyn, as you are 17 years old and you are immersed in that population of teenagers, how do you inspire activism among your peer group? I am pretty lucky with, especially my friends. Um, they're all very active and want to make a difference. Um, but I think if you just, like, you need to appear to what they want, their interests. Um, if you make it on social media, they 
will very quickly do what you need them to do. Um, and you just need to like adhere to them in the right way. Um, so it's just important for them. They like to feel like they can do something. Like you give them something to do and they will do it because it gives them a sense of importance. So, yeah. Excellent, social media is certainly a powerful tool. Um, Wally, finally the same question to you. And I also wanted to fold into that a question that came from one of the participants about enacting change through the arts. How do you begin? How do you begin on the journey of enacting change through the arts? And what platforms on social media do you find to be the most effective with sharing your work? Well, I think there, there's so many forms of being a change maker and using art to do so. And, and of course, so many different disciplines. I, I'll speak from my own personal experience. I always felt that uh, the spoken word was a great platform because it was so easily understood and it was so easily accessible. It, you know, you didn't need an instrument. You didn't need, uh, you, didn't, you didn't need to be, uh, it, it could, you know, a lot of people have to be in a certain area, you know, um, if you want to play a sport, for example, you got to be on a basketball court or you got to be on a soccer field. You know, that's your that's your way to express yourself, you know, or you got to be uh, in a band with a whole bunch of musical instruments. But for me, spoken word was so easily accessible. And the reason I wanted to you know use that as a catalyst was because I could I could share it anywhere. I could teach a poetry workshop anywhere. I didn't I didn't need. Uh, there was no limitations or restrictions on on how I could use it. It was so easily accessible that I could go to an inner city school in Toronto, where you know kids are are coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So they don't have they don't have lunch money or they don't have uh, resources or, or accessibility to some of these things that other more privileged students do. And I could bring in spoken word and tell them about writing, and all they need is a, is a pencil and a paper, and they're good to go. That is a powerful thing because financial barriers are, are very real, especially people who want to who want to create a change and make a difference. I mean, you might not be able to donate money to a cause, but you can give your time, you can give your energy, you can give your your creativity, and that's always how I felt. I, I wanted to make change and help others come to the same realization that it's not always about just money. I think financial barriers are are, are very real, but you can always do something creative, and so I think that's something that I really feel. Is, is true to my own personal narrative. But again, I think there's many different forms of, of change making and, 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 and activism. Uh, but the platform, so social media, I think has been great. I also think that it's been not so great. I mean, there's really dark parts of Twitter. You go on, on Twitter and you, you end up on some really weird page and you see the kind of things people post and it kind of makes you lose faith in the world. But I, 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 I simultaneously think that there's lots of good to it. So I think everything in moderation. I don't believe social media is exclusive uh, in terms of what you should be doing. I think a lot more work needs to be done in real life than online, to be honest. And a lot of people also have some fake humility and fake profiles and, and fake approaches. You know what I mean? Just because you post a black square on your Instagram does not make you an activist. I know a bunch of people that put on that black square because they're too scared to say anything else. I mean, if that's the conversation that you want to have and that's the kind of image you want to portray, then, then fine, but it's not genuine, it's unauthentic. I mean, you want to post a black square, but you can't go outside and, 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 and protest or you can't even have a conversation with your black neighbors. What's the point of doing it? And I think a lot of people forget that because they get caught up in trying to appease to the mass on social media. And because Black Lives Matter trended for, for three weeks, now, everyone in, in North America is an activist because it's a black box on their social media. It's ridiculous. What about the people who are doing this work for years? What about Mark Lamont Hill, right? Who has been literally doing this work for years. And people, and people forget, you know, there's, there's so much to be done. I think that social media almost makes it look easy if you put, you know, this little black box and you put in a Black Lives Matter card on your link and buy all of a sudden you're an activist. That's not true. That's not true. And there's too many people trying to jump on this bad wagon to use it for PR. And so I really think the world the world needs to take that into consideration when we think about activism and that a lot of the work starts on the ground. That's all I'll say for now. Those are some really excellent points and they help segue us into the final question. We have about eight minutes left on the panel. 
Following that, we'll take about a five minute break, um, at which point we'll come back and Kaylee will lead us through an interactive second session with our panelists. So we do encourage everybody to hang out. Um, moving into the last eight minutes or so, the final question that we'll ask to the panelists are, we are here commemorating Nelson Mandela's work. Today, the United States lost a legendary civil rights leader, John Lewis. Both men were tremendous activists who left incredible legacies behind them. How in your work have you created so solution-oriented sustainable activism? And how do you encourage others to do the same? And again, anybody who would like to speak, so I don't have to put Ashley back on the spot. Part of this was inspired as well by Melina, your earlier comment about your community action plans and leaving something tangible so people can continue the work even when you're not currently there, which is such a powerful tool. Okay, um, maybe I should just comment then on, on the community action plans thing, you know, but also just generally about sustainability. Um, I mean, it also goes back to what we spoke about yesterday, you know, sort of your strengths and your limitations and what you can and can't do, what you're good and not good at. And I had to realize that very early on because, you see, I had a big vision. I had a big plan as to where we want to go and where I see things going in the next 10 to 15 years, but I didn't have all the skills to get, to get it done. And President Barack Obama is actually one person that said that no great thing has ever been done um, on its own. So you need a strong team. I think in terms of just sustainability in general of your activism, you need a good team. Um, you cannot create legacies or bold legacies on your own. Uh, you need to find people with the right skill set, with the right heart, um, you know, with the, with the same drive and commitment that you have for the work. And I think as found, that is foundational, actually, to creating sustainable work in communities. Because if you don't have the right people around you that support you, that shares the same vision, that understands the issues the way you understand it, then you will not be able to be sustainable or impactful for that matter. And with, with the Community Action Plan, I mean, since day one, when we started the organization, it has always been about the people. It has always been about us transferring what we know, what we have, our tools, our resources, and hand that over to the communities or the constituency that we serve in order to make them feel empowered, in order for, make, for, for them to feel that they are in control, that they are taking responsibility, that they are accountable, because those are things that is not happening in communities. And we thought that that was going to be, through the community action plans, one way in which we can sustain, you know, the impact of our work over time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Did any of the other panelists want to address that question? Ashley? Yeah, I think I, I hesitated at first because um, I would say that we're not yet sustainable. So maybe I could talk about just how we're trying to get there. And, um, and I think, yeah, so for, I mean, Sprint for Her has been going on and off uh, since 2016, but we've become a solid, like every day, consolidated, have a team um, organization only since April. And so it's only been like a good few months. I mean, it's been intense and it's been wonderful, but we are realizing that especially when things are volunteer based, no one makes, you know, we don't even have a bank account. Like we say, we, you know, we send, we encourage donations to grassroots organizations. So it's all volunteer based. And right now, you know, it's, it's a tough time for young people in terms of the working world. You know, people have either just lost their jobs or can't find jobs or, you know, are trying really hard to hold on to their jobs. And, you know, everyone, it's like everyone goes, wow, there's so much going on. How can I be doing all this for other people? And I think it's exactly what Melina says. It's about having a really good team and being able to lean on people and being able to say, okay, guys, sorry, I got a big deadline this week. I'm going to be offline from Monday to Friday, um, but then I'll, I'm free next week. So if someone else needs, you know, and it's all about leaning on each other. It's about um, knowing your expectations. There's no problem, like knowing your limits rather. There's no issue with dreaming big and keep those big things out there you know try and keep yourself going and trying to strive for more but knowing that okay in the next few months we're probably not going to change the world so what steps do we need to do to get there what can we do in bite-sized chunks that we can build on and build on and build on until we have something that is going to sustain itself but also that we will be able to carry on doing it in our lives so that it doesn't come a point where you 
you have to choose, you know, having a job and, you know, doing this work that means so much to you. And it really is about balance and about just having the right people around you. And um, yeah, I mean, we've been really lucky on our side that we have a really great team. And I think that's um, a lot of, yeah, what, what makes things sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Ashlyn, uh, you've been at this work for a little while now. I mean, I've made a point of mentioning your age because I find it so inspiring, but you have been doing activist work now for quite a few years. How have you created sustainability and what you're doing? Um, I think one of the things is my mom. My mom does a lot of, she helps a lot. She's our CEO and she does quite a bit for us, which is amazing. Um, and we have a great committee for Raising Hope um, that they love what they do. Um, they're always there if we need like extra support, if we need someone to go say, even if it's just setting up a new bank account, there's always someone that's willing to do that. Um, and having a great team has been a huge part of the reason that I'm still doing it today and having just the support of family members and friends and just like everyone that's there like to remind you, like if you're not feeling it, like you, don't really want to do the activism today is people that remind you why you do it which sort of puts you back onto why you're doing it set you like straight again incredible thank you and wally finally if you wanted to speak a little bit towards sustainability and longevity within the activist realm. yeah i think there's been some i think there's been some great points about teamwork and, and building the right environment around you um i second all of that i really that I also think it's really good to, uh, to be grounded in your own values. I mean, really to believe in what you you preach and, and to live it. I think a lot of people sometimes will speak. It's harder to take your own advice sometimes, easier to speak it. And living it and, and, and walking your truth is the most important thing, I think, to being sustainable in your work. Because if you're living it, then you're really doing it every day. And a lot of people sometimes, as I mentioned in my previous point, a lot of people will do things to show that they're they're doing some great work. They'll make donations, but as long as they get their their tax receipt and their name somewhere on a plaque to be recognized for it, I think you know it's it's so much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than to do things for recognition or the chase clout by being an activist, quote unquote. You know, I think it's really about believing what you do, even when when, when no one's watching. You're still doing the work. You're still being that person. You know. A lot of people are activists when the camera's rolling, but when they're off, they're not. And so I think sustainability is about living and preaching your truth. Thank you so much. This has been truly an inspiring hour. Thank you to the panelists for your time and for sharing so much of your work with us. Before we go into our brief break, if you would be willing to uh, turn on your camera, we want to do a boomerang of excitement so we can put it up because we love boomerangs here in uh, the Kaylee campaign. I think that's safe to say. So if you could un or take on your cameras, we're actually going to do two because there's two different screens of participants. So I can't tell you which one you're on. So you'll just have to be excited twice. Ready? So I'm going to count us down uh, a three, two, one. And I'm asking that you do something very visually exciting. Right? Ready? Three, two, one. Perfect, perfect, all right. I'm going to go to the next screen and I'm just going to send this again very quickly so that we have it. Sorry, technology, this is where I need the youth to make this easier for me. You can just ask my students. All right, and now we're going to do one more on the second screen, ready? So again, you don't know which one you're on. Look excited, one, two, three. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, again, please hang out. We look forward to working with you in the second part of our session today. Okay, um, just to reflect for a second on the panel, I'm super grateful and excited that I know these phenomenal people and I have them in my life as, as activists, but also just as 
friends that we get to vent about stuff to. Um, and so I hope that you guys have, have learned some things uh, from these epic humans and also um, just kind of reflect on the people that you have in your life who help you to do your own activism um, in whatever space you find yourselves. So we would like to now have your voices, all of your voices heard in a bit of a different um, space, a more private kind of intimate space. Um, so how this bit is gonna work, we're gonna have, I'm gonna give you guys two questions um and i'm gonna send you away into magical breakaway groups and then you'll have maybe eight minutes per question to kind of speak about those things i'll send you reminders um in time to kind of say okay thank you like move on to the next question um and this is really your opportunity to claim this space um and own your work so um oh after the breakaways you're all gonna magically come back to this big main room and um Please allocate a person in your group to give feedback to the rest of the group. It's okay if it's um, two people, as long as you kind of figure out how you're gonna divide that feedback. Um, we would like to have as many people um, sharing as possible and engaging. So, oh, I have to give you the questions. <laughs> I nearly sent you away with nothing to say. Okay, so, um, the first question is going to be, is everyone ready? Yeah. Do I'll type them out in the chat too, Kaylee. Perfect. Uh, so the first question is, what work have you engaged in within your own lives or in your community? And that can be whatever it is, um, not just specifically activisty things. Um, and then the second question is, what challenges or struggles have you overcome in those things? Or what are you currently working on that's like a challenge is that cool for everyone are we all on the same page yes okay beautiful um if just for um uh efficiency please keep your responses to like two minutes so that everybody has enough time to give input beautiful i'm going to send you away magically are you ready <laughs> okay there's everyone back Wonderful. I'm so excited that that worked, you guys. Seamless. Hey. Okay. Um, so before we um, go into the individual um, group, uh, what? The feedback from each group. Um, we're going to do some typing engagement. So can you guys 
Give one word for how you felt about the, the breakaway groups. Just put it in the chat and we'll let it live there magically. Um, inspired, beautiful, uh, energized, impressed, assured, exciting, informative, curious, diverse, wonderful. Keep those things coming. Um, Inclusive, I love it. We, does everybody have um, a designated human to feed back to the big group? Uh, do you have consensus on these things? Um, okay, so for this to work, I need you to make a scene because for some reason, the raise your hand thing for the participants is not working on my side. So, make a scene if you are the designated human for, for feedback. And then unmute yourself and bring the beautiful conversations to the big group. Kristen, are you making a scene? <laughs> I'm worried I'm going to forget everything. <laughs> okay, go ahead, friend. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, we couldn't unfortunately hear the sound of one of our participants, but uh, I, I, I think everyone else was South African. Um, but we had a teacher. We had someone who works, um, who manages staff in a factory. And um, we spoke about creating um, a culture of um, conversation and being curious and um, really allowing ourselves to ask questions. And, and um, so the, the person who was managing the, the staff in the factory was talking about how it's difficult to create um, work a unified work culture that serves everyone. So we had a, a, a few points um, around how do we create um, a compassionate space that um, that is not harmful um, and is um, understanding to everyone's different worldview. Because one of the, the things that we spoke quite a lot about is how uh, so many parts of all of us in with so many parts of all of someone else all the time. Um, and just to bring those um, different into the conversation and um, to, to ask questions around why someone believes something, um, if it could be prejudiced or discriminatory towards someone else, um, try to understand why they see it that way um, and figure out what parts are missing that they aren't understanding about how their behavior or their, their ideas are hurtful. So yeah, thing and yeah, glad. I hope that is enough <laughs> feedback, um, but yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kirsten. That's so, Kirsten. <laughs> yeah. So um, that worked really well. I'm excited. Um, who is going to represent the next group? There were eight groups, so we're going to need at least eight people to speak. Ruth, are you putting your hand up for us? Beautiful. Okay, um, I'll try and do this without passing out from nerves. Um, but um, our group was a very inspiring. Um, we had people from South Africa and uh, Kazakhstan even. Um, and we had teachers and students, which was amazing. And we talked a lot about how people can get involved in activism and involved in their community. And we talked about how um, people should, should find ways to get involved. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean starting your own project. 
but that it's equally as important to follow somebody else's or let somebody else speak and stand back and support them and be the follower because the follower is just as important as the leader. Um, and we talked about, especially today, a lot of the problems we having, especially as young people, is that we expose to the media um, and a lot of the time it's just bad news being thrown at us all the time. Um, and we as young people need to know that there is hope and sometimes just have to shut ourselves off from the internet for a bit and revive ourselves because in order to be a, a to be a strong activist you have to be strong yourself and um, be comfortable with yourself I, I think yeah amazing good job um I love that um I love that all these different groups come from such different places and people are coming together with all the different perspectives. And it says 10 out of 10. Good job. Um, so who's going to go for the next group? I propose. Yes. Okay. So um, also talking on the screen, it's a little bit nerve wracking, but you know what? I can do it. So um, uh, it was just me and another person in my group, just the two of us. So um, anyway, it was pretty, it was really engaging, interesting talk. So we um, were both from South Africa. So, but the other person in my group was an English teacher in Vietnam. Uh, and that was very interesting to, for me to hear. And we uh, came to the conclusion that, or came to a conclusion that one of the biggest um, challenges or um, obstacles in um, like uh, little organizations and uh, <laughs> I can't think of the right word for it now, is definitely um, getting people on board and funding. So, yeah, that was, uh, I don't really know how else to describe it. We had a very interesting discussion on that. But, yeah, that is my part. It was very, yeah. Cool, that's my thing. Oh, and the words. Um, good job for overcoming the nerves of speaking in front of all of these people. Um, I am super excited that all of this feedback is happening and that everybody was engaging. Um, I know there were some technical issues with sound and stuff, but we made it through. So, Who's the next person? Hannah Sambo. Let's go, girl. So our group also talked a lot about funding because one of the problems with all of these, like with activism and all this is COVID. There's not a lot of funding and a lot of like usual people who would fund it, like businesses and stuff, aren't able to do that because they don't have enough money to support themselves at the moment but um, a lot of communities are coming together and instead of like donating money to certain causes, they're able to say like restaurants can donate food and different like companies, like t-shirt companies can donate clothes to people. And that's what one of the things that's been helping a lot. And also like the people in my group were very big on like inspirational messages, like Riley and Amalia, they wanted to make rocks with inspirational messages on them. But their problem is that they don't have rocks. <laughs> So they needed to find rocks and like money to buy paint and everything. So one of the biggest problems that we discussed was definitely funding. That's about it. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a really big issue that people are definitely talking about right now, especially in the midst of a pandemic. Nobody knows how to deal with the pandemic. Um, and so 
we don't find new ways of of um finding solutions and there are also problems that we didn't even know existed so yay for pandemics in that way <laughs> creating new ways to learn lessons i guess um so i'm told that for group eight ashley stegna has been chosen so take it away <laughs> Yes, um, I have been designated our representative. So um, I was with Zelda, um, Karen, and Lydia. Um, and actually, Zelda put um, in the chat box international because we were spread all over. I'm in the United States. Lydia was in um, Great Britain and Lyd uh, no, Karen, sorry. And then Lydia and Zelda are in South Africa. Um, and we really had a great conversation about how people are unwilling to change um, or at least listen to other people's viewpoints on a lot of these hard social issues, you know, regarding racism and um, bigotry towards disabilities. Um, and we talked a little bit about ableism and how people aren't willing to listen to other viewpoints and at least hear other people out. Um, and how they're also ageist. Um, Lydia's 17 and she was talking about the fact that, you know, there are people who don't want to listen to her because she's quote unquote young. And I've actually experienced it as well, where just because I'm, I'm going to be 30 in a couple of weeks and people tell me all the time, like, well, you just don't have the life experience. So we talked a little bit about that and how just because we're not out there doing it all, all the time, what we're doing behind closed doors is also really important. Beautiful. Thanks, Ashley. One, one thing that got to me when you said that was like life experience. And one thing that I always say to people is that if you say I don't have enough life experience, you are invalidating my entire existence. So don't do that. Um, uh, awesome. Okay, we need another person. Rose, are you putting your hand up for us? I am. Um, so I'll represent our group and we were very international. So I'm from South Africa and we had Wally from Canada and we had AJ from Jamaica. And I think kind of um, we spoke about our areas of activism and where we do advocacy. And I think we were all passionate about our different areas. So it was around immigrants, around inclusion um, and around um, children in orphanages. So kind of we, we were involved with things that we were passionate about and that kind of keeps us going. Um, and then in terms of challenges, I think for all of us, it's very much sort of hands-on face-to-face work that we normally do so it's been a huge challenge to adapt to the new reality of lockdown and restrictions and things um, and we've had to go back to basics and sometimes things have been able to go remote but for others we've had to adapt and go back to things like providing food um, in South Africa and Jamaica that was something that sort of projects had refocused on because that's where the actual need of clients is now. Awesome. Thanks, Rose. Um, I just want to do a quick shout out to Rose because she is a phenomenal human who has endless energy for the work that she does with us at the Katie campaign. So, yay for Rose! <laughs> okay. Um, we, uh, Sophia, are you the designated human for your group. Yeah. Yes, I am. Uh, on my group, we actually had a lot of people um, from different places. So Africa, um, New York, and I'm from Angola. And all of us actually talk about the way we adapt our projects to the COVID situation. Me and Ashley are more social media focused. I do like work on my account talking about anxiety during quarantine and other controversial topics like the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the police brutality in my own country. Um, Kirsty and Tiffany um, give like more resources to people 
food and help them deal with the situation that's going on. And Maisie is like learning on, on like protesting. Um, but because of this COVID thing, she had to like switch it up and she actually does drawings of the victims of police brutality. And I think that's so cool. I wish I could do that. Um, and we talked about also like the struggles, you know, because in this pandemic, we all had to adapt our way into our activism, I can say. Um, and it's really hard. Sometimes we can't understand if people are supporting or not because they don't talk about it on social media. But it is also important to talk about it in your own home. You know, you need to correct people when they say things are not right. Um, do it in your own house and then like push it to the whole world. Yeah, that's what we talked about. Awesome. I love this so much. I'm so excited. Okay. Um, I think we have one more group. Is that accurate? Anastasia, are you the last group? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, we are the last group. Um, so we actually chatted a bit more about um, how, so we were also Africans um, and we chatted about how COVID um, and lockdown has impacted um, our lives and um, our interactions with um, the community. So for instance, we had a teacher in our group and she chatted about how she teaches um, grade R and she um, she also teaches um, differently abled um, children. So sometimes it was quite difficult for her to um, switch to the virtual world where inter physical interaction is really important, um, especially for young kids. Um, but then she highlighted that um, she had managed to switch to Zoom and WhatsApp call video calls really successfully and managed to actually get um, parents more engaged and involved in their children's education. And that's actually, um, so we're chatting about how COVID's actually brought families together and made us really focus on, on the important things in life. Um, another example is um, another, um, two other people in our group were um, really involved in recycling. And they said that um, although it's been a challenge, um, so the one girl Kendall actually collects recycling and organizes um, um, recycling in her neighborhood I think and she said it's a bit of a challenge with COVID um, to sort of um, handle the actual physical bins and that kind of thing but they've still managed to do some recycling and um, collect rainwater and stuff with the empty bins that they haven't managed to fill um, and also um, Paula was saying that COVID has made made her um, focus on recycling more so I think a lot of people have more, um, in their normal lives are so busy and they think oh like recycling is such a mission and it's going to take so much time that they don't actually do it whereas i think lockdown has made a lot of people step back and be like okay well i have time now to do these important things and focus on those things um yeah so that's what we we sort of chatted about and we also um spoke again about how it's really important to have like community engagement um within projects and community ownership of projects to really actually um, make things go forward. Um, there's no point in like um, handing over a strategy um, to develop a community and then like no one really takes it any further and it just sort of dies as you hand it over. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think you made a lot of um, valid points, Anastasia. Um, I think um, one thing that um, comes through in this whole webinar is that everybody comes from very different spaces, but there are so many things that we all connect on and so many things that we, that bring us together as, as people and as activists in whichever spaces we are in. Um, and thank you so much for everybody um, sharing, because I think that it's a really big deal to come in and be thrown into a group with five random people and to share <laughs> your life story. 
So I thank you for being brave in those um, in those moments. Um, I think that this has been a really good um, start to the webinar series. I'm super excited that, that we had so many of you on the group. Um, I want to do a quick promo right now. So hold on to your seats, people. Um, so uh, I want to make these webinars about different issues um, every month. And our next one is going to be focusing on refugees and their experiences. Um, you do not have to be a refugee to join the group. So it's about sharing stories. It's about people learning from other people's experiences. I'm really excited to have um, one person confirmed so far is Bowani and Dume, who is um, a fellow International Children's Peace Prize winner. Um, he will be speaking to people. Um, we're going to do it on the, um, we're thinking about the 22nd of August, which is a Saturday. Um, so keep uh, that in mind. I will update you with that in due course. Um, so I'm really excited. I hope that you've learned and gain something from this um, this webinar and like meeting these people and hopefully you can continue some of the relationships if you want to. It's totally okay if you don't as well. Um, so this was just a little bit of a moment to connect with people from around the world and um, share some experiences. So before we go, we're going to create a slight amount of chaos. And uh, I'm going to ask you all to, um, to unmute yourselves so that you can say hi and bye to everybody. And then um, feel free to receive the one to um, I'm gonna ask if the panelists can stay for a little bit afterwards just to wrap things up. But thank you so much to everybody for arriving and staying. It's been beautiful. And um, yeah, see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy the rest of the Mandela day. Bye. 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 awesome. I'll see you, Pilar. You guys have been amazing to work with. Cheers, guys. Follow the Kelly campaign on Instagram. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>